Hello and welcome. My name is Gay Hendricks, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2021 Mindset Mastery for Business Leaders Summit, hosted by my friend Nicole Holland. I'm delighted to discuss with you, as a business leader, how you can tap into your creativity and more directly integrate living in the genius zone for yourself and your company. Gay Hendricks, welcome. I'm super excited. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you and to dive into your genius in helping others realize and live their genius. I would love to kick things off today with a question about really how you as a business leader and a leader in general um, got yourself out of any particular situation. I'd love it if you could think back to a time when as a leader, you were feeling stuck, perplexed, you just, you weren't moving in the direction you expected to. And I'd love it if you can share an anecdote about something that you did when you recognized that, how you paused, made the genius move and were able to come out in a more productive, more joyful, more uh, fluid way. Well, I probably have a whole stack of those here in, in files that I've used the stories for my book. But as you were asking, <clears throat> I had a memory of something that happened relatively recently. Um, well, recently, probably seven or eight years ago. Um, I, I did something that I now know better to do <laughs> than to do. Um, but I got caught up in I really liked this one individual that invited me into a particular business deal. And I liked one of the other individuals, but I, I, another one I didn't know very well. And so I'd say to put it all on myself, I failed to do my due diligence about exactly what I got into because I was kind of blinded a little bit because of the couple of the people that I really liked. And so anyway, to make a long story short, a very long story, <laughs> too long. Uh, I uh, kept getting into very unusual kind of arguments or wrangles with this particular individual that I, I didn't know as well as I knew the other two. And he was a kind of a famous person too, that added to the, uh, so I had an image of him that was different from how he kept showing up in real life. How many times does that happen, folks? <laughs> and uh, so, um, but I, I didn't do my due diligence. I could have asked several other friends of mine who'd been in business with him and found out things that I later found out. But anyway, I, I kept running up against the same kind of argument and having conflicts with him and, um, Finally, I kind of dropped into it and I said, uh, first of all, I kind of went into the victim position. Like, what is this going on there? Why is this guy being so obnoxious to me? And so um, the more I got into it, I kind of dug myself into the position of being the victim and him the persecutor. But what really sprung me free of it was taking responsibility and saying, Hmm, of all the possibilities, why would I dial up this particular conflict? You know, why would I do it this way? And what I came up with was that he reminded me of some undealt with stuff. He was a lot older than I was. And so he had some undealt with father stuff that I didn't get cleared up. My father died really before I got to know him. And so I, um, had never had a father figure around. And I think I projected things onto uh, this fellow. And when I withdrew the projections and treated him just like everybody else, I immediately made moves to get out of the business. <clears throat> and so I was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, I was able to get out of the business in a way that I actually prospered and made money out of it. Whereas I think if I'd stayed in it, it would gradually have tanked the thing. And so um, that would be a good example. I'm not saying that every time it's going to remind you of somebody from the past, but a lot of times it does. A lot of times you're beaming out projections that are based on some old relationship that hasn't been around since 
you know, 50, 60 years. And same thing is true with siblings. I have people in here all the time who are business uh, people in uh, family businesses. And some aren't even in family businesses, but they still run projections from their old family life onto the business that they're in. And so we always, you know, one of the things we use here at uh, our institute is a 20 point openness to learning scale. And we, um, we don't sell it or anything, you, but when you come here to uh, work with us, you usually end up taking that. And what it does is identify 10 very popular ways of closing yourself and preventing yourself from learning and 10 easy ways to open yourself from learning or to learning in every situation. And here's the thing, the reason we do that is because openness to learning is one of the most important facilities any person has, but it particularly in business because business a lot of times I've worked with executives who were more committed to being right than they were to being successful. And that's a big problem you got to get out from under if you're going to be successful in business. You've always got to be calling yourself on the carpet in some way and saying, how is my programming, my old programming, getting in the way of my being completely effective here? And if you can open up that degree of openness to learning, I can almost guarantee success for you because you'll be receiving feedback all the time. And how you respond to feedback makes a huge difference. Um, in, the, in the new book, The Genius Zone, um, you know, most people have read The Big Leap or many people have read The, the Big Leap. And the, uh, the Genius Zone is a little different because The Genius Zone showed you how to jump into, make that big leap into your genius zone. The genius zone shows you the moves to make to stay there, to live there all the time. And uh, if you've ever seen a bird take off, sometimes it takes a lot of energy to get going. But once they get up into the wind currents, all effort ceases. They just kind of ride easily the, in, uh, the wind currents. And the, the new book, The Genius Zone, is about how to harness those wind currents so that you get them blowing in the right direction so you don't have to effort. I get people all the time in here who are 40, 45 years old who are very successful, but they tell me some version of this following story. They say, boy, I don't know if I can keep doing this much longer. I had to you know, operate at such high speed to get here that I feel like I'm about to burn myself out unless I make some kind of adjustments. And what often is happening um, there, Nicole, is that um, we all get a call to genius. Usually it starts in our 20s and 30s, but then by the time you're 40 or so, um, you'll be there someday, don't, don't worry. Um, but uh, I, I know it'll be a while for you, but uh, I, uh, I know you'll be there someday and you'll have this to face. A lot of us face this at midlife, which is we don't understand that the personality that gets you to 40 is not the one that's gonna get you from 40 to 80. A lot of us have a lot more effort in the system that gets us up to 40. And then at 40, you need to ease up and go more into your effortless natural genius and stay out of that you know, revved up mode. I've had some sad experiences of having people come when they were around 40 and then deciding not to do the work, you know, when I kind of explained to them the path that I think they need and they didn't do the work. And then later on had some terrible health problem happen. And I always feel so sad about that because, you know, life doesn't give us a lot of second and third chances. Sometimes one heart attack is all we get, you know, sometimes you, you get more, um, you know, earlier warnings and things like that, but a lot of uh, people don't. And so um, I like to have people open to learning as best they can in a conscious way. And one way to do that is uh, to quit defending yourself against the stuff that's inside or the stuff that comes at you from outside. When somebody gives you negative feedback, you wanna jump all over that and say, wow, okay, what can I extract from that? Maybe some of it's their BS, maybe some of it's something else, but. What can I extract from that? I used to uh, go down to Austin, Texas back in the 90s, um, Round Rock where Dell Computer is. And uh, 
I used to go down there to coach uh, Michael and his executive team, which was mostly uh, three people. And boy, it was a really amazing. It was the first time I'd ever worked closely with a billionaire and a person who was not only a billionaire, but getting to be more of a billionaire practically every day that <laughs> he was, that I was there. And uh, so um, the thing that impressed me the first time I worked with him was how quick he was open to learning. I mean, he didn't stop a split second. You know, I would give him some piece of feedback or something that may not have always been pleasant to hear or anything, but it was like, boom, how can I use this? Boom, how can I integrate this into my day? Ah, oh, that is such a beautiful thing to witness. And that's where I got the whole idea originally of creating the openness to learning scale, because sometimes I'd go to another corporate boardroom the following week and I'd find instead of that kind of openness, I'd find a few people with their fists clenched and their frowns on their faces and, and you know, the fists over the chest kind of thing. And uh, because everybody gets dug into their egos and needing to be right. One of the things that I pointed out in the big leap that, um, that I really wish everybody on earth really knew is that those upper limit problems that we hit over and over again are caused by fears. They're, they're based on a fear that we need to pay attention to and say hello to and ah, take a breath into. And what happens though, is that people, when they run up against a conflict outside themselves, often try to solve it by doing more and more of what already isn't working. You know, it's just like I've seen people when I've been in foreign countries of attempting to get a person who doesn't understand their language to understand by yelling at the person, you know, and uh, trying to uh, get it through that way. But the it usually only resolves itself when people can step out of their egos for a moment and just honestly face and become transparent to things that are going on inside themselves. Recently, I, I don't know, uh, Nicole, did you ever read Ray Dalio's book, Principles? I um, I've been recommending, uh, if you haven't read it, I've been recommending it because I got it out and reread it um, the other day. It's a big book, <laughs> it's a huge, so it's a whole day. <laughs> uh, but it's worth it because he talks about the principles he assembled over the years on a personal level, not just on a business level. It's not about the technicalities of business so much as it about how to come at the whole enterprise in a way that you prosper rather than uh, shutting down. And Ray's a great example because he went all the way from a big initial success to a blowout where his <laughs> business was him and one other person rather than him and 300 other persons, but then went back to being a, 700 person organization and him becoming a billionaire many times over. Um, but it's all based on principles of transparency, being more open to what his programming was and being, uh, there was this one point that will really touch a lot of listeners and viewers, I think, where his top three people came to him with a memo and it was called the something like the Ray Dalio feedback memo. And they basically said to him, Ray, some of the ways you act are causing our business not to be as successful because you have a blow up at this, 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 and then you're over it in 10 minutes, but that other person takes three weeks to get over it because you forget all about it. Anyway, so they went through it point by point a number of really devastating things. <laughs> and, and so, of course, like anybody else, he probably had that moment of defensiveness, but simply he started taking apart every one of them and figuring out what he could change and what he couldn't change. And, and so it was a moment of transparency and then over and over again, becoming more and more transparent. But the thing is, it became a, a culture-wide virtue to own up to mistakes instead of hide mistakes and um, to go to somebody that you're having a conflict with and ask for 10 minutes of uh, what around here we call conscious listening, where the other person just listens and breathes rather than responds. Okay, so 
oftentimes, <laughs> here's my saying, after, after working with a little over a thousand executives and 80 or 100 businesses, I can tell you that business problems are almost never about business problems, <laughs> that they often have a, a measure of some kind of personal glitch in them, some kind of miscommunication. Uh, you know, at one point, one of uh, Michael's executives um, in the beginning said, you know, I, I just have a phobia of being stuck in an elevator with Michael, you know, and so uh, because he, he was at the time very uncommunicative. And so it's such an important thing, though, to have an openness to learning in your life and in business, because if you don't, if you get defensive when life is trying to teach you something, wow, it's like the way I say it is you life teaches you with the tickle feather tickle if you're paying attention. It says, hey, pay attention to this. Tickle, 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 and you pay attention to it. But if you're not paying attention, out comes the sledgehammer. And I've had lots of tickle feathers, and I've had a few big sledgehammers um, in my life. And I can tell you, I wildly prefer the tickle feather. So that's all openness to learning. It's all about getting yourself so that you're willing to listen rather than be right. I don't know if it was in the big, uh, the big leap book or the second book where uh, I told the story of uh, arriving late for the airplane. Did I? Uh, anyway, oh, it doesn't yes. matter which book oh, it's in. Yes, the time cop. And the yeah, yeah. Yes, so that was the big. Uh, do we have time for me to tell that story because it illustrates Absolutely. a key point? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, I was traveling to. Uh, I believe, in fact, I was going to Round Rock to. Uh, and you have to change planes in Dallas, Fort Worth to get to Austin. And so my plane had arrived really late. And there I was with my wheelies and I was just hurrying. I always tell people hurrying is a sign of impending mental illness. So don't get into hurry. <laughs> and, but I was violating my own advice. I was wheeling along there at 110 miles an hour with my wheelie behind me. And in, in Dallas, Fort Worth airport, of course, you probably have been there, it, you have to get on a train and travel around to a whole different part of the airport. And it's a huge place. And my plane was at the other end of the airport. So I'm wheeling along and I look up at the uh, TV thing and it says boarded. Oh, my plane to Austin is boarded. Oh. And so I know I'm not, and oh no, because the next one is like 11 o'clock at night or something like that. So I'm looking at five hours in the Dallas Fort Worth airport. So um, I'm, I suddenly decide, wait a minute, I'm slowing. The airport is bored. I'm going to go down and just see what's what. <sighs> so I took a breath and I just got into the present, right into the now. And I'm enjoying myself walking down there. And I get down to the kiosk where the uh, plane is, the podium, I mean, and there's a guy screaming at the poor clerk. And this guy is saying like, I have a ticket in first class for this airplane. And what are you telling me? I can't get on it. And, and she was saying, I'm very, very sorry, sir, but we closed the airplane. We made the announcement. He was saying, but my plane was late. This is United Airlines fault, not my fault. You know, you get me on that plane. He was being really obnoxious about it, clearly stressed out to the max. And so I felt sorry for the clerk. And I just kind of stood back a little bit and just kind of, I oh, took a few easy breaths. And so the guy stormed off and he walked up the concourse and he's yelling and fist waving and everything. And I went up to the uh, clerk and I said, whoo, one of those days, huh? Or something like that. And, and the clerk said, you wouldn't believe it. Ah. And so I said, uh, I heard the conversation. So uh, my plane was also late and it sounds like there's not much of a chance of getting on board and she started saying oh no i'm really you know nah, nah. she went into her little spiel just then the door opened to the airplane and one of the flight attendants comes bustling out kind of quick walking up there and i hear the following whispered conversation we had a miscount we've got another seat in first class and i look up the <laughs> <laughs> concourse at Mr. What his name <laughs> and the clerk did too kind of looked up and by then he was about a hundred feet away but I saw him you know the clerk says oh, I'm not gonna get that guy and so she said 
he took my ticket said here you go dr hendrix and uh i stepped right on uh in first class so um it's it was for me a good illustration of how you can kind of let go of the expectations let go of how the world seems to be connected and then open up a new connection with it so suddenly who knows how that seat in first class got there i like to think it was magic but uh maybe it was just a miscount I think actually that story you shared in Conscious Luck, which is something that I highly recommend anybody who hasn't, um, who, who's not already familiar with Gay's work, check out Conscious Luck. Um, I feel like from a mindset perspective for folks who are not already familiar, now I have to thank um, my my mentor, Adam Urbanski, because he introduced me to the big leap in my late thirties. And I have to say that it really, your work has had such a profound impact on me and the way you talk about Ray Dalio's book and it's a big book and you gotta, you know, you go back through it. I do the same thing with the big leap at least once a year. And I find that it's that mindset of of not sweating the small stuff, being able to recognize it, being able to see those those, or feel those tickles, see the opportunities opposed to the obstacles. And I think that the more we release our attachment to our ego, um, we're able to recognize those. And you've, you have unpacked so much there, Gay. Um, I want to <laughs> highlight a few things. Well, one, like honoring your fear, I think is a huge thing that I learned from you. Um, so that I don't, I don't, I don't have to hide from it or run from it. I just have to acknowledge, allow, and be aware. Say, how is this showing up? And through the anecdotes that you've shared through the Big Leap and in all of your work, um, I really love how you illustrate that. And and so again, I really highlight. I really recommend anybody who's not familiar with Gay's work. You know, grab the. Um, conscious luck book it's a really easy read it's really actionable and it'll get you in that mindset if you're already if you already believe that you're lucky if you already believe that things come to you and it's about alignment and just you know being aware then go right into the big leap and even maybe start with the genius zone because as you said gay that's really the it's almost is it really a follow-up to the big leap or is it sort of a prequel to the big leap? Um, I look at it really as a follow-up to the big leap because the big leap shows you how to jump into your genius zone. And the genius zone is really about what you can do on a daily basis to stay there, to get, to keep identifying more and more of your genius. You know, if there's one thing I think we disempower ourselves as human beings because we don't take advantage of the full organic ability of ourselves to transform ourselves. You know, therapy and counseling and coaching and those kinds of things are great things being in mastermind groups, but in a way it all starts with your ability to open up and love yourself and trust yourself and get, get that conversation going with your own natural creative genius. I guarantee you it's there. I've been around this planet 30 some times since I started writing books and giving seminars and things like that. I've been in so many cultures and I haven't found one yet where genius isn't available. And to me, it's one of the greatest discoveries that human beings can ever make is the moment you begin asking yourself, what is my true genius and how can I express it in the world? Once you get that conversation going, look out because, wow, you're unstoppable. Then it's just getting more and more of yourself out of the way so that you can have more and more of your genius on display. And, you know, I wasn't born enlightened. When I started thinking about this stuff 40 years ago, I was spending five or 10% of my time in my genius zone. And then as I began to work with myself and more people, I got up to maybe 30%. And what I mean by that, that three hours out of the eight or nine hours of day of work, I was spending 
when I was spending a third of my time in my genius zone, I was spending three hours a day doing what I most love to do and what made my biggest contribution to the world. Then I made a commitment to, by the end of the last century, um, by the time 1990 rolled around, I was using maybe 30 to 40% of my time in my genius zone. And then I made this big, bold commitment to be at 100% by the end of the century. And gradually I got there uh, and have been there ever since. And the beauty of that is, you know, it sounds like it may have taken a few years, which it did, but once I was there, then it was just a, a matter of, of steering using the principles I give in the genius zone. So I kind of look, I used the big leap ideas to get me into my genius zone. And I've used the, um, the genius zone ideas, the new book ideas to stay there effortlessly over the years. And a lot of it has to do with what you're willing to say no to, as well as what you're willing to say yes to. Uh, I believe in a principle I call the enlightened no where I can learn to say no, and I have learned to say no in a way that's empowering to the other person. I, I had a recent example, a woman um, uh, brought to me a book, uh, a huge book uh, by way of a friend of mine, asked me if I would uh, look at the book with an eye toward giving her a blurb for it. And, and it was a lovely book, and it was obviously a lot of work, but it just wasn't in the sweet spot of what I felt like I could with my heart recommend. And so I told her that, you know, I said, uh, in fact, here's the conversation I had. It, was, it went like this. I really appreciate the work that went into that book. It's a beautiful book, the pictures and the text and all of that. And I found myself kind of withdrawing my interest after a couple of chapters because it's just not in the sweet spot of what I'm interested in. And so I can't in good conscience give you anything to, you know, since I, uh, that would be all I could say about it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I can't really do anything as far as a blurb, um, but I want to um, focus on that you might want to try to find somebody that's a little bit more in that niche than I am, because uh, it doesn't quite fit for me. And so, what happened? It was so beautiful. I got back a great email from her. She said, you know, I was very disappointed in what you said, but the way you said it, I have so much more respect for you now than I ever did before. You know, that you were able to say no in that way. And that just made my day because I think that, well, like it's within, with, one of the things we do around here, we have a program called Attracting Genuine Love. It's a, um, a web-based program that single people use to create the, uh, the love of their life. And uh, we've been doing it for 20 years now. And one of the things we do in that program is we ask people to come up with their absolute yeses and their absolute noes for what they want. We have a special way of doing it in the program. Uh, so it's worth spending an hour over, but just a general idea is that um, you, you figure out what your main yeses are, but you need to figure out also what your main noes are. And so, because life, and especially if you're an entrepreneur or you know, building a business, saying no is just as important as saying yes, because you're gonna have to say no to a lot of things that are not in the sweet spot of your genius. And every time you do that, if you say no to those things, your power grows, your ability to manifest big things grows. But if you can't say no, or you don't know how to say no in an empowering way, ooh, that can be, get to be a real, um, now, I kind of learned that the hard way, way back 30 years ago, because I had an, an employee and she made a thousand dollar mistake. OK, and so we kind of gave her another chance. And then she made a thirteen thousand dollar mistake. OK, you know, we did some coaching and that kind of thing. Then she did a forty three thousand dollar mistake. Now, who's the stupid person in that situation? <laughs> you know, because 
and I look back on it. Why didn't I let her go after the 10th? It was almost like she was asking for it, you know, like, and, and later she did tell me that she was kind of asking for it, but didn't know how to quit. And, you know, she had two little kids and uh, all that, and she hated her job, <laughs> but, you know, so those kind of things happen, but why didn't I pick that up? Why didn't I listen in such a way that I was able to counsel her appropriately or, or fire her appropriately or whatever, but, I let it stick. You know, it's like I used to say, the slower the surgeon, the worse the wound. <laughs> you know, if you got a surgeon that takes his time or her time through there, it leaves a bigger wound. Well, I've had to learn that one the hard way in terms of uh, enlightened firing of people and uh, separating them out of my life and things like that. Most people I've found, I don't know if you've been, this is true for you, but um, Nicole, but I think most people only really need for friends, four or five people whose faces light up when they walk in the room and who make your face light up. You don't need a hundred people like that. You know, you need a, a core crew of people that are just for you 28 hours a day. Absolutely. And Gay, I think that I just want to take a quick pause because first off, I just want to say one of the two probably most profound, but I could be wrong because there's so much profound, but one of the two most profound things that I think I've learned from you that um, have made such a difference in my life and are things that I consciously work on are number one, the enlightened no. And then number two, I want to talk about in a sec. But before I do, I would talk love about what I missed that second thing. I'll tell you in second. just a sec. But before we do, I'd love everybody to grab your phones, grab your your uh, Apple or Android and I want you, yes, let's take a screenshot, hello, of us. And I would love it if you would be willing to post that out on your social <laughs> and make sure you use hashtag MMFBL, Mindset Mastery for Business Leaders. That's the hashtag we're using through the summit, MMFBL. And also at mention gay, gay Hendricks, G A Y H E N D R I C K S. And let us know what has been so far your most profound takeaway. <laughs> I, I should do this too, right, gay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting lots of good pictures Yay! of you today. I snuck some in when you weren't looking and you didn't know. So I got some for you too, but I would love to see these posts. Um, I will be searching hashtag MMFBL and I want to know what your biggest takeaway has been from the session. And I know Gay and his team love to see these as well. We'll make sure that they get them. Um, Gay, the other thing that I have recently come to realize, I think is, such a huge knowing for me has been such a huge clarifying thing is that the the 100 responsibility so i was recently reevaluating you know i loved your story your anecdote at the beginning about working with folks in business that you respect that are older and maybe you didn't know them as well as you expected or you thought and um, I had a similar situation not too long ago, and it caused me to really reevaluate who are my people, right? Who are really the people that I want to surround myself that are team Nicole, that are, that are, that I love promoting. I love supporting, like it just lights me up and who feels the same about me. And one of the things that I came to recognize is that my people who I work best with, who I support best, who, who I just I'm inspired by the most and we have the best chemistry are people who take 100% responsibility for 100% of the circumstances in their life or are on their path working towards that. And that's something that I learned from you. And as I applied it to my own life and I catch myself constantly, oh, wait, I'm playing the victim. Wait a minute. What's this? Go what's going on here? just that awareness and, and being able to quicker, more quickly over the years come to recognize where am I not taking responsibility? How is that hurting me? And what do I need to do to get back on track? 
it's been so profound. And then realizing I have been attracting people and engaging with people who are not of that same mindset. And so that to me has been huge, recognizing that the people I want to surround myself with, the person who I want to be at my highest and best is somebody who takes 100% responsibility 100% of the time for 100% of their life. Can you speak to that concept just for a little bit? Because we are going towards the end and then um, we'll start the wrap up. Yes, taking 100% responsibility for something is a powerful act because you step out of the victim position and take and empower yourself fully. Instead of why are they doing it to me? Your question becomes, hmm, how did I manage to create this? And what do I need to do to create something different? Uh, so um, I've used that principle now for gosh, more than half my life. And it's always produced hu huge payoffs because it, the reason why is because when you take pure 100% responsibility, you open up a space of creativity then because you're no longer giving away your power to another person and saying, you're me making me upset. Would you stop doing what you're doing so I won't be upset anymore? Now the question becomes, hmm, how did I happen to enroll this person in my life to do this? And do I need to keep doing that over and over? No. <laughs> and so the... The 100% responsibility place is really the only place of safety and freedom because you've taken back all of your power. And I, um, I use that principle all the time and especially in relationship issues because in relationship, people get stuck in the victim position and sometimes go around and around and don't get out of that position for decades. I mean, I've had couples in here who have been having the same argument for 25 or 30 years because they dig themselves into the victim position, start pointing the finger of blame, then the other person points the finger of blame back and they go round and round and round and round. And so that's a central problematic drama situation that we create ourselves. You know, it's it's the there are two things basically that you've touched on. One is the the importance of telling the truth, being honest, being transparent. The other is taking responsibility in a healthy way, not blaming yourself or not taking it on as a burden, like, oh, I got to take responsibility for it. No, it's the joy of it, you know, saying, wow, I created this. Now, how can I create it a different way? I had a, a long time ago, I was, a fellow came in and he told me the following story. He said that um, he'd been given a large trust fund, but, um, he had managed to whittle it down through bad investments and making a bunch of dumb, you know, always buying the new Ferrari and stuff like that. He gradually just about wiped himself out since he'd had the trust fund. And so he said to me, maybe I'm beginning to wonder if it has something to do with me. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, that's a good, since it was your money and you lost it, let's find out why you lost it. What does the money remind you of? And the answer was right there. He said, oh, well, you know, I inherited it, I inherited it from my father. And I said, well, what was your relationship like with your father? Oh, I hated my father. Oh, okay, I can see why you would want to get rid of his money in such a reckless fashion. Oh my God, you know, I had never thought of that because he was so into, I'm going to get back at my father any way I can. Well, he loves money while he was still alive. I'm going to get rid of his money. You know, so these kind of old programming things get a grip on us. That's why it's good to have yourself uh, surrounded by three or four or five people who really know you well and can call you on your stuff and say, hey, what does that remind you of that you're doing now? Does that remind you of anybody that you've had issues with in the past? So those kinds of questions uh, lovingly asked can be incredibly liberating. Absolutely. Um, so one more thing is your, your new book, the genius, the genius zone, right? Yes. <laughs> um, you talk about, yes, beautiful. Um, I got it on audible and as much as I love hearing your voice, I, the, the narrator is not bad. <laughs> well, I, I read the introduction. Yes, you do. I read, yeah, yeah. I always enjoy hearing you. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it, it was, um, I really enjoyed listening to it and it was familiar and, you know, some people love the hard copy. Some people love listening. Some people love the, the PDF. It's all available. Um, and I would love for you to touch on briefly the genius move, because I think that this is something also that everybody here that's present can leverage even as they walk away today without like understanding all of your work, I think being able to know what is the genius move and how do I do it um, for myself quickly and succinctly to get myself a step ahead. I'd love if you can just share a little bit about that and then we'll let people know how they can actually get the book themselves and all of the rest. Good. Well, thank you for mentioning that. The one of the two big concepts that the genius zone is about is one called how to recognize the genius moment. And we get dozens of genius moments every day. And a genius moment is a calling for you to bring forth your genius. And the book shows you how to recognize that. Uh, but what the genius move is, is, and you need to sit down and give yourself 30 or 40, 50 minutes to learn this by going through the book or listening to it on Audible. Uh, but I can sketch out the main aspect of it is that when human beings get stuck, when you're feeling off center inside, or you're having a conflict, or you're, you can't figure out something to do with your business, that is a genius moment. Instead of something to be avoided, it's actually something to be opened up to. Because if in that moment, instead of closing down and getting defensive, if you can open up and let go of that defensiveness, what's trying to happen is your genius is trying to break through. And if you can let go of trying to control your genius and just let it open like a flower organically and naturally, it begins to serve you. Genius has to be wooed like a lover. It has to be invited forth. You can't beat on it like you beat on the lid of a trash can and say, come out, genie, bang, 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 bang. Remember how the genie in the bottle got released? You rub the bottle, you rub the bottle, you woo the bottle, and then the genie comes out. And that's how you can release your genius is just by gradually wooing it. Start with this specific thought. Say in your mind, I'm willing to experience and express more of my genius every day. That'll get you on the track. Just that one positive thought will begin to open up a dialogue with your genius with you. Beautiful. It took me a moment to uh, to get my mic on there because I'm like sitting here scribbling notes so fast. Thank you for sharing that, Gay. And where can people go to continue the conversation with you? Get the book, um, Next Move. Good. Uh, get the book at geniuszonebook.com. And the reason to get it at geniuszonebook.com, you can order it there through Amazon and all the other. But if you get it through that website, you will get the 15-minute uh, audio meditation that I record in my own voice that's got five key affirmations from the Big Leap and the Genius Zone, the things that I want you to be focusing on every day. And many people are listening to that 15-minute uh, it's got music with it and everything. They're listening to that every day. Uh, but even if you only listen to it one time, it really opens up space for you to begin to focus more on your genius zone. Beautiful. So one last question, and then we'll say goodbye for now. Um, if you could summarize your message for business leaders, um, you know, thinking about all of the work you've done over the past three, four decades and, what um, what you feel is the most important takeaway, what would you love to share with our audience? Well, here at the Hendricks Institute, when you graduate from some of our seminars, you get a, a little uh, silicon band. And on that band, it says, breathe, move, love. Breathe, move, love. And why we have that is because in every situation, we want you to open up and use the natural organic gifts you've been given. So next time you get stuck, take a few breaths, they're free. And take a moment to move your body a little bit. 
most of us aren't designed to sit for more than 20 minutes at a time. We need movement in ourselves. That's why if you could see what I'm sitting on, it's kind of a big bouncy stool with a spring on it. It uh, doesn't even have a back on it and it allows me to move and breathe. And then the last is that life is really about opening up to loving ourselves more deeply and loving others more deeply. And at the bottom of everything in business, it's all about human interaction. And to the bottom of all human interaction is either a flow of love or not. And my work is all about showing people how to open up to a greater flow of that love and life energy so that they make the maximum use of their natural gifts. Gay Hendricks, as always, such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Great being with you.